this series, we host activists who use drugs and harm reduction researchers and discuss drug policy reformation, structural inequities in drug treatment and harm reduction systems, deconstruction of the disease model of addiction, and alternate ways to think about drug use. Today's session is on drug user-centric drug policy, and I'm lucky to be joined by some of the most formidable leaders of the movement, Tamika Spellman, Peter Krykent, and uh, Anne Livingston and Louise Vincent. So first, I'm going to ask each panelist to introduce themselves, though this group of panelists almost requires no introduction, with their name, pronouns, affiliations, and their past and current experiences with drug user organizing, telling us a little bit about their journey into and their motivations for this work. And um, Peter, I'll start with you. Thanks very much, Katie, and thanks for, uh, for inviting me on the webinar. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Peter Krykant. My pronouns are he, him. And I uh, work for an organisation in the UK called Cranston. Um, I suppose I'm most well known for running the, the first, unsang first unsanctioned and to date only um, overdose prevention centre or drug consumption room. Um, in the UK, which I operated from the back of a decommissioned ambulance in Glasgow City Centre. Um, to give you a little bit of background, you know, I've been a drug user most of my life. And my main motivations for, um, you know, doing this work and doing what I do and campaigning and actively campaigning and trying to support um, people who use drugs is, is simply due to the fact of the you know, the amount of people that I've lost around me, you know, it's like uh, the death toll here in Scotland is um, very similar to, to the death tolls that, that we see in North America. And to put that in a little bit of context, we don't have uh, synthetic opioids in our heroin supply. Um, so there's no fentanyl um, or, or, or drugs like that um, at the moment. But despite that, um, you know, as I say, we've got some of the highest death rates in the world. And, you um, you know, we just don't have basic harm reduction. You know, we don't have like um, overdose prevention centers. We don't have um, diamorphine assisted treatment. You know, we don't have like any sort of real safe supply. We have a real coercion um, into abstinence and faith-based programs, um, which have, have been the influx of what we do uh, here in the, the United Kingdom since, you know, the, the 70s really, you know, faith-based residential rehabilitation centers. Um, and aftercare packages of go to go go back to uh, your council estate and go to to these uh, abstinence based recovery program meetings. So um, I suppose that's probably enough of an introduction in terms of uh, from me. Thank you. Okay, um, Tamika, do you mind giving us your name, pronouns, affiliations, and your past and current experiences with uh, drug user organizing? Again, like some just your journey into and some of your motivations for this work? Absolutely. My name is Tamika Spellman. I am the Policy and Community Engagement Manager for HIPS in Washington, D.C. I am also a member of the Urban Survivors Union. Um, I come into this work because of my decades of experience as a drug using sex worker. Um, one of our more uh, recent accomplishments in the DC area would have been the uh, passage of a bill to decriminalize all paraphernalia across the board in December of 2020. And we are currently working on a bill with a bill to decriminalize the possession of personal use amounts of substances in the District of Columbia. Um, I come into this work mainly because I am sick and tired of how the system is uh, coercing people into the criminal justice system, which is not the right approach to addressing drug using issues. Drug using issues are a health issue. They are a mental health issue, you know, and jailing people for their substance use is the wrong answer, has been the wrong answer for decades, and it is not a winnable war. It should not be a war. It should be a health concern that people are looking at in a different way. And with us asking for 24 hour harm reduction centers in the District of Columbia, the premise around that is to also to provide 
a safe consumption space where we can check people's drugs and give them back to them and let them know what is in them. You know, because across the board, fentanyl is starting to invade a lot of the supplies across the board. And it is not fair to people that are using substances to have this adulterant in the drugs and them not being able to counteract it. You know, this is a health concern because this affects people's lives. And losing a life unintentionally is an issue when you're not out here really trying to harm yourself. Even as a drug user, my thing was, I need to make sure that I'm being safe with what I'm doing. And, you know, <laughs> it has gotten to the point where I'm terrified of using the drugs because we don't know what's in them anymore, you know, and without a safe way for us to be able to check and monitor what is in the supply and to be able to share that information with other people, we're going to keep losing folks, unfortunately. I'll pass the mic. <laughs> All right, um, Anne, and you are definitely one of those figures who practically need no introduction in this movement, but could you just give us your name, your pronouns, your affiliation, and your past and current experience with drug user organizing, your, your journey, and your motivator, motivators for this work um, quickly, if you don't mind? Yeah, I, I'm um, not a person who identifies as a drug user, and I moved into the downtown east side. Um, one of the huge influences was that my oldest son had cerebral palsy. And uh, so I had this whole analysis of systems. I moved two blocks from Maine and Hastings, which is just the epicenter, but it's a really nice little co-op with, you know, a playground and stuff. And I was on welfare, and I just heard the sirens day and night. We had this huge peak in overdoses. And fairly naively, I just figured that, you know, the welfare department, I had been an activist around poverty issues, single mother issues, community issues, and we had been organizing, um, you know, men who, the, the, the neglected, employable male who they always want to just die on the street, and then they started dying on the street. So I come at it from a community organizing point of view, but also with this philosophy of, you um, I guess it's called asset-based community development. It's often very, you know, choirs and um, bowling clubs, you know, that kind of stuff. But for the most part in my neighborhood, it was just to say the experts on this are the drug users. We just started organizing drug users and we did it with no money. And we, when you do stuff with no money, no one can fire you. And we had a tiny little grants and we were just making as uh, you know, which it was a very practical thing. I think in 1996, we set up the first injection site without even realizing that it was such a, such a radical thing. And um, anyway, so it's a very, very long history, but it's based on this kind of grassroots organizing with people who are extremely knowledgeable about what's going on in the streets and, and in jail and in detox and in treatment and on the methadone program. Like they're super experts because what I find is no one knows what else anyone else is doing. You, you know, the methadone people don't know anything about jail. The jail people don't know anything about OPS. It's like on and on. So we had a long history and went for the basis of all of my work. And this is my, you know, it's sort of ironclad and I've been doing it for 30 years. Forming the drug user group is the basis for all future action. And, it's ex and, and you can often do it with extremely tiny amounts of money. It's um, fraught with, you know, whatever. I'm just saying that. And so that's my history. And I'm now 68. What am I? Yeah, 68. And so I've been doing this for a really long time. And if I go look at the notes from 1996, uh, it's pretty much the same stuff. So if I view it that way, I feel like a terrible failure. If I look at all of the um, actions that we took, we successfully got, you know, the first injection site in North America and, you know, but I find as we lobby for things, and John Zabel points this out in his work, uh, we do it as activists with nothing and as experts. And then we demand that the, the government fund it and then they do and we become clients and patients and just total humiliation. And so I think the real trick in, in future organizing is that we don't just keep getting stuff for what I call our enemies, these huge NGOs that take over everything right now, everything and a lot of stuff's run by mental health and uh, they don't know a damn thing about drug users and they marginalize them. And with coming from this real 
you know, uh, like in Nanaimo, just recently, we had this OPS that was outdoors, uh, open 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, man, it was a slugfest. And it was, you know, 200 drug users a day were coming there. But our organizing stuff was uh, less strong, you know. So anyway, I'm just saying um, there's uh, periods of civil disobedience and then there's periods of a lot of education and it's taking inspiration from other projects around the world. We've always done that. Thank you. Um, and lastly, Louise, for a second, I thought I was going to have to introduce the panda. Do you want to just uh, give us your affiliations and some of your uh, journey and your motivations for doing uh, drug user organizing a little bit of your history? In it? Sure. So sorry about the panda. I couldn't get him to go away. I, I thought this is going to really be bad. Um, yeah. So my name's Louise Vincent, and um, I work on the leadership team with um, Urban Survivors Union, and work um, as the director of North Carolina Survivors Union. And all of what we do has to do with organizing drug users, um, and certainly, um, you know, started at a time. You know, I I, I can't help but but my my mentor um, just died, um, Thelma Wright, who taught me everything really that I that I know about harm reduction and brought me in early on. And you know, and and it just reminds me of a time. It's sort of there's sort of nostalgia because it reminds me of a time, you know, where she brought me in. We met, and and three days later, I was flown to to Tacoma, Washington, um, to 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 Dave Purchase's uh, syringe. Um, exchange conference, and I had never seen anything like that. And so working with folks like Thelma and Mona and the folks in the South, um, trying to do this work underground, you know, where it was illegal and um, we didn't have a lot of support, um, you know, and then and then trying to turn that into something that's legal and building upon that and sort of so so all of the, all of what that looks like, and and certainly, you know, being a, you know a sort of free from the state, and then accepting money from the state, and what does that look like, and how do you then advocate against the policies that, you know, you you're you're sort of beholden to these groups because they've given you some money, and so does that change how you speak to them, and does that change the way you engage with them? And what I've found is that people that use drugs, we need, even if we're going to, you know, when we went out there for death by distribution, there was no way we were going to win. There was no way, like, there was no way that, I mean, that bill was going to pass. I mean, it was a drug-induced homicide bill. It was passing. But we needed to go out there and we needed to say no. We needed to be in unison and we needed to be in direct action. And we needed to do that for us. We needed to do that because it's good for us to be out there together in solidarity, hand in hand, you know, and, and, and I'm so grateful I get to be a part of that with the folks, you know, on this panel with, with Katie, like, I, I mean, just from the, you know, the beginnings of really getting National Survivors Union up and going and, and really trying to build with something and, and having, you know, and, and getting to watch all of the talent. And all of the amazing work um, that that people that use drugs can bring to the table, and all that we can do if people would just have some patience, and and remember that like you want people that use drugs, don't get mad at them when they act like people that use drugs. <laughs> you know, like you can't you can't call on us to be people that use drugs and then not want us to be people that use drugs. It doesn't work that way. So you know, a lot of patience, a lot of flexibility, a lot of a lot of you know. A lot of laughs, a lot of tears. I'm grateful to be here and thanks for including me. Um, and we're just gonna move to the round table questions. But first, Louise, I wanted to highlight a theme in what you just said. I think what something that really struck me is that you kind of redefined what policy success is. Sometimes Success looks like policy failure in the moment, but it's about community building in the long run. And I think that's a lesson that we often forget when we're just focused strategically on uh, near term goals. Um, and I'm just going to move to the first question, which is 
Um, can you briefly describe the campaigns you've led and what is your definition of a drug user led campaign? And Tamika, I'm gonna turn that one over to you first. A drug user led campaign is just that, led by drug users. <laughs> you know, putting the most marginalized people on the forefront to tell their lived experiences with how negatively the system has interacted with their life and, 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 and of their drug use. You know, one thing that has been certain, it does not work. And it does not work nationally. It does not work locally. Punishing us for using substances has been like the bane of our society. This is a health issue. This is an issue that is personal to people that cannot be policed away. Arresting me and putting me in jail did not help me ever. What helped me was my connections to harm reduction services that taught me that there are other options. And one of those options was to self-mitigate harm. And then they, they were the only ones that ever, uh, ever put in, planted the seed in my mind that I could arrest my chaotic behavior by going to see a therapist. The courts never did that. The police never, ever, at any time in the process of arresting and jailing me suggested I needed therapy. They thought that making me do drug testing and, and fining me and making me pay restitution was the answer. No, it wasn't. It put more stress on me. It made me want to do drugs even more. That was not the right approach. It never has been. You're punishing people for behavioral issues. And it devastated inner cities. It devastated black and brown families the most. The crack epidemic was terrifying in my neighborhood. I am glad that we are now approaching this from a different stance because of the opioid crisis. But did it have to come to this to actually look at the human side of what a substance user has to go through. And then we, we, we're out here punishing everybody for substance use when everybody does not have chaotic behavior. And, you know, looking at how we have this system of abstinence and harm reduction, abstinence didn't work for me. And under their theory, I am still a drug user. I smoke weed and I drink. I just know I can't smoke crack. And I've been very successful at it. But under the abstinence only theory, I shouldn't be using any substance. It is supposed to take me directly back to where I have been. Well, I haven't been there in 12 years. And I know what works for me. And I know it can also work for other people. But if we do not, as a country, as a nation, take those steps to move in that direction by stop policing them like this, stop arresting them. Stop jailing them, direct them into services. I needed services. I needed mental health care. I needed stable housing. Housing is a human right in this country and we don't do that. The way that this recovery system is set up, it's just ass backwards. It shouldn't be abstinence only based. We have to get outside of these negative mindsets of punish, 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 and move towards rehabilitative things. Rehabilitation saves lives. Opening the door and, and, and giving people options that do not involve jail, that do not involve the criminal justice system or police are the things that we need. Um, I'm going to give it... I'm so sorry, Tamika. I'm going to give it to you next, Louise. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the campaigns you've led, uh, Reframe the Blame, HB, and you know, opposing HB 918, and what's your definition of a drug user-led campaign? Yeah, so I'm with Tamika, drug user-led campaign, led by people that use drugs. Now, like that doesn't, like one of the things I say about allies is like, you're a good ally if you'll fight with me. Like if you'll come and fight with me. Um, one of my favorite campaigns that you didn't like 
was was our big love campaign. And that was in West Virginia. And that wasn't even connected to any legislation. That was, they didn't have syringes in West Virginia. And so we went there with two goals and they were really easy. Um, and it was based on, um, you know, Dan Big come in with his van, you know, in Indiana when the HIV outbreak happened and we were thinking, you know, the same things were going on in West Virginia. And so we had the big love, everybody made banners and we, you know, people in different places that couldn't be there through the banners over bridges, you know, you know, we have pictures of them and they posted them. Um, and, and then those of us that were there, we were there with faith and harm reduction. We were there with, you know, the national union, whoever could get there. I mean, not well planned. Like we did this within, you know, like, you know, our deal is like, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just nobody can die and and everybody needs to get back home safely where they came from. And like, we're good. Like if everything else falls apart, you know, that's okay. Um, and basically we were there to show people that use drugs that they were loved and cared about and they had more power than they knew and give them illegal syringes. And that was our, that was our plan. And that was, that was the, that was the campaign and we succeeded. It was a successful campaign because we met those two goals. Um, you know, now more on policy, we did reframe the blame, which is a drug induced homicide. Um, you know, and we're gonna about to revamp that because it's drug war back on ladies and gentlemen. And, and folks like, this is like, I haven't heard in a long time, you're not gonna arrest your way out of this problem. Like, I think we're trying to arrest our way out of this problem again. Um, you know, we, you know, one of my favorite campaigns was House Bill 918, I think, I think it was 918. Um, and it had to do with the child custody um, for pregnant and parenting people that use drugs, because this, this group really had very, it had no drug user, like activism connected to it. It really didn't have a huge pool of people that even understood pregnant and parenting people that use drugs. I think in North Carolina, there might have been 10 solid people that could speak to the issue without mucking it up um and 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 how how exciting i mean we worked with universities we worked with everybody we could we could find um and 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 held webinars and and held uh, you know I, I mean we we ended up getting the bill vetoed um and but by the governor and he used some of the language that we used in his um in his, in his, I mean, we were really proud. We were, I can't remember exactly. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. There's things ringing that I didn't know were on. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to turn it off. Um, yeah, but we, we did House Bill 918 and that was, that was really, and that's been ongoing and that campaign has stayed together really nicely. Um, and so that's working with the reproductive justice folks and, um, and also working with the, um, we worked with the Open Society Foundation. We worked with, you know, we had we had some media people that helped us, which was really nice. You know, anytime you can get help from other groups, like when people have media contacts and, and when they have people that can help you frame media, that's really helpful and set up media events so that you are, I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've been trained in, and how to speak to the media and how to and how to how to do those things but it it's always good to have that refresher course because you know for the most part i've i've had good people interviewing me until um this one of these last campaigns and the guy was really quite nasty and it was really nice to have like a media group that could help navigate and negotiate some of that but i mean there's been we have had We've had we've had quite a few campaigns, which is really exciting for the small group that we are with the little amount of money. But I think it's what brings us together. Like that's what I have to say about it. I think that when we look at our skill set, sometimes we get bogged down in what's the skill set of 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 like folks and what can we do. And I really think direct action is where our hearts are. It's where we're reminded why we're together, so we don't tear each other up. You know, it's like, it's like it's, when you're out there hollering and, and screaming no more, you know, of this or that, like it's it's real and you do feel like you're doing something because sometimes it just feels like you're getting swallowed up by the drug war. It just feels like it's like there's no like this is not going to happen in my lifetime. This is certainly 
you know, it feels overwhelming. And so to at least get out there and say, you know what? No, we're against this and have the, you know, I've been going through pictures and stuff and looking at some of these direct actions. And it really is, I think it's what, it's what makes a union. It's what makes it possible. So I am, I'm going to shut up because there's lots of people that have to talk. I'm, I'm always talking about how uh, one of the strengths of the drug user community is that we're all such great orators and rock and tours, but it might work against us in a, um, in time constrained environments. So I'm going to skip to the oh, next the question way. and address it to uh, Peter and Anne first. And that question is, um, what successful tactics and strategies have you used in your campaigns? How would you suggest that other drug user led organizations can replicate these strategies? And what are the most significant barriers you faced in your policy work? And, and I'll address that to you first, Peter. Uh, so strategies and barriers. Thanks, Kay. Um, so yeah, I mean, like being on this webinar just now, it's actually, you know, a, a, a little bit envious of what goes on in sort of America and Canada and other places, you know, like when you hear about the National Survivors Union, you hear about Dolph, you hear about Vocal NYC, you know, you hear about um, Van Du. Um, we simply don't have that here in Scotland and, and in the UK. You know, we don't really have these active drug user movements. We've got a little bit of input from like Euro Input, um, International Network of People Who Use Drugs, etc. But it's all kind of outside the UK, really. Um, and that's always been one of the most difficult aspects for me of doing this this type of organizing here you know like recently i just organized a conference in brighton and we had sort of uh, zoe dodd coming over um to speak and cassandra frederick you know and um you know we we see uh different states in america and can and canada now regulating cannabis and in the uk we are talking about reclassifying cannabis as a class a substance you know to set it alongside heroin and um, you know, cocaine and crack and stuff. I mean, I get that a lot of the conversations that I was having, you know, you reclassify cannabis and this like drug exceptionalism. So all of a sudden cannabis is this acceptable drug, but now we kick heroin users and crack users even harder um, because, you know, the, the, the drug exceptionalism. So in terms of organizing, a lot of what I've done um, has been around you know, my own individual campaigns. I mean, up until three, four years ago, until I got up, got involved in this type of work, you know, I had no experience organizing campaigns, no experience, you know, trying to, um, you know, encourage drug user activist networks, et cetera, you know, or doing any media, et cetera. You know, the first time that I'd done a media interview, the, 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 the BBC News reporter said to me, well, what if you're doing something illegal? What if you get arrested? And I was like, well, I don't care if I'm doing something illegal, let them come and arrest me. And, you know, it's all about, like Louise was saying, you know, for me, it's just been learning as I go, you know, how I would answer that question now is I would say that actually I'm not doing anything that currently has a legal framework, but I believe that we're not breaking any laws as drug users supporting other drug users to stay safe in a safe environment, you know, something along those lines. Um, but for me, as I say, it's always been about just learning as I go, looking to the other networks, but being very new to this, you know, when you hear about the experience that's on, on this meeting just now, you know, like 30 years of experience from Anne and, you know, obviously I've looked at a lot of the work that Anne's done and, um, you know, just was watching the CBC um, stuff last night, um, CBC TV stuff last night from a couple of nights ago. Um, and, you know, for me, as I say, it's just about learning and how, how do we get to a point where we create a, a safe enough environment in Scotland and the UK for, for people who use drugs to actively become involved in organising. Because in my experience, when I set up the unsanctioned overdose prevention centre, it was very hard to get anybody to stand beside me. You know, you look at the experiences in Canada, you look at the experiences in Copenhagen, where in Copenhagen they've got street lawyers, you know, they've got doctors, they've got nurses, a group of medical students at Glasgow University wanted to come and volunteer on the service that I was operating. They, they created a Google Doc. Over 80 students signed that Google Doc who would have been allies, who would have came out. And then the head of the medical school at Glasgow University came down on them like a ton of bricks, sent them all an email saying that if they got involved in this, they could be in, 
charged with the concern of the supply of substances. If somebody dies, they could they could be charged with manslaughter and that they could lose their whole medical careers. Why would they want to waste their whole lives on helping these drug users in Glasgow? Um, it's absolutely ridiculous. So again, a lot of what I do is just going out there. I took my van out to the Scottish Parliament. I got a big megaphone and I shouted out the megaphone to the public health minister, you'll go and visit an overdose prevention site in Paris, but you won't come out and see the van that's parked at your front doorstep. So shout, organise, try and make, try and follow the example of, of what I'm hearing to, here today. I think that even despite these barriers of isolation and institutional uh and institutional like silencing that you're talking about, I think you and Louise are continue to illustrate that one of the first principles that we're talking about here is just to start going out and doing and doing something, you know, even in the most low resourced way possible. Um, and Anne, from your decades of drug user organizing, could you talk a little bit about um, successful tactics and strategies you've employed and also the most significant barriers that you've faced? So we've had, um, I think the times have changed. Uh, for one thing, uh, we when we first started this, we didn't have just every single member of our organization living in the street. They were They were housed in really shitty housing, but that was a thing, they were housed. Also the proportionate amount of welfare they were getting wasn't as completely absurd as it is now. And I just heard they increased the welfare rates on the last budget, blah, blah, blah. But the, the interesting thing we did is um, we just kept pounding away at the public opinion stuff. So Bud Osborne was a poet. And um, you know when you win people's hearts and minds, the hearts get won with the poetry. So it was kind of a bizarre coincidence that him and I teamed up and um, that was a very influential thing in the 90s. It was also, you know, a tragic time. We didn't think we were winning. Um, we won um, this gradual, you know, it, it, if you're in British Columbia now and you run, although with the last city election was reversed this way, if you don't, this, this one doesn't support harm reduction. For, for many years, we dominated city politics and both Bud and I ran for city council, which gave us the opportunity to, um, you just needed a thousand dollars or at that point it was a hundred dollars and you just go to these endless horrid meetings with you know you get three minutes to speak on a microphone but it was very powerful to let the public know about the overdoses anyway so there's a there's the I think that broad approach always needs to be taken and at that time the students were not forbidden to come if a law student you know, it made their resume look well-rounded that they had done some, you know, work on behalf of the poor, even though they became a corporate lawyer later. And I started to really see this over a period of 30 years now, that they have to watch their P's and Q's or they're going to get fucked for their whole career because they've been associated. Blah, blah. So those are really significant changes. But the interesting thing here and right now in the setting that we're in, and I, it's something we can say, if you get as much as we've gotten. So we got the provincial government to support harm reduction in a broad way. They're constantly releasing this funding to the health authority who's supposed to open the OPS and they're all got trembling lips and wringing hands because the numbers of overdoses keep going up. And then the insincerity is that they never open. So what I've discovered is that we've won a provincial battle and the provincial government's sending money down to these localities to open these OPSs. But here's a very significant finding, and this fits very well with my philosophy about organizing drug user groups. You have to be hyper local. You'll need a drug user group in Nanaimo, and then you'll need one in Duncan, and then you'll need one in Surrey, and then you'll need. So I'm like the Johnny Appleseed of drug user groups. And the, the, um, so because I just, you know, I do anything, you know, it, it, and there, we're not, we're not winning. There's tremendous increase in the overdoses here. So, um, then so that was a I, I I have a hard time convincing other strategists in this movement that it's all well and good and we can get that and I think we should celebrate it. But you've got to understand that we need this strategy at this hyper local level. So I'm working in Surrey in Nanaimo, and this is the other barrier that is so weird. I don't give a shit if you pay me. I don't care fuck you i raised three kids on welfare 
I'm clever. I'm from a middle class background. My parents were activists. You think you can fucking fuck me over? You know, I have this kind of, I don't say that publicly, but that's the kind of internal strength position I'm working from. So no matter what they dish out, I always seem to think that I have a, you know what I mean? Like I, I sometimes, you know, someone should interview my kids and see if they've been terribly damaged because I raised them in this environment. But anyway, I'm just saying um, that is a huge barrier that you don't get paid. And yet when they do pay, we'll get these squabbles and there's a whole drug user movement that I absolutely appreciate and may have started with the civil rights thing. They get jobs now. And I keep trying to say to them, don't fucking neglect the well that we dug that got you those jobs because you could not get a job as a drug user. And it was something we fought for. But then to see the government purposely undermine the, the, the social justice part of this movement, which is at its core, by um, trying to turn paid drug user groups, you know what I mean? Just this kind of fake drug user group thing. Well, you know, we're good enough. Where there, there's a very, I, I'm a very rigid, you know, preachy old woman about drug user groups. They have to be run democratically. You can't just say, because too much of the, um, what's going on all the time is they're just plucking their pet drug user and bringing them to a meeting and getting them to go along with anything. And it's not even that they're going along with it. They just say, you were at the meeting and we decided this and you were at the meeting that implies you went along with it. Just it, like, it's evil. So that's what we're really, you know, those are the bigger strategy things. And then, um, I just think my my message to everyone is just keep persisting with students. I don't know why there's not an army of old women like me because I'm now on a pension. It's a shitty little pension, but I can figure out how to, you know, get a lot done, you know, as an like put in many hours of volunteer work and not, um, you know, starve to death or anything, you know, just saying. Um, yeah, I think Anne. That's very uh, well taken your point, you know, that appropriation and tokenization are such insidious barriers because at first they look like victories. And we in the US are definitely seeing some of the effect of that now that you in Canada have been dealing with for so long. Um, I want to address the next question to two of the most uncompromising women I know. And that question is, um, what compromises have you made in your policy work and how do you differentiate between acceptable and unacceptable compromises? And I'm going to start that one off with you, Louise. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can do this. Um, yeah, so acceptable and unacceptable compromises. You know, I think you, I've been talking a lot about this. This seems to be a conversation that we're having more and more and what what really comes up is where is the hard line? Where is the, you know, like we have to decide sometimes where's the hard stop? Like where, like what are we willing, like it seems like there's so much wrong that like you can convince yourself, well, you get a little bit of good here, at least I'm doing this. And I think, I think we have to really have that hard stop. And I think we have to put those hard stops in place. And then I think we need a team of folks to help make the decisions around it. Um, because, you know, it, it takes more than one person to make these decisions. And, um, you know, and, and you're always sacrificing something, even if it's just time. I'm going to go really light on this. So I, I think it's really important to look at what you're sacrificing. Really, I mean, I'm a big fan of like having mentors or whatever you want to call it. I don't know that mentor is the right word, reciprocal learning, but really making sure that I'm talking to, to people with different learning styles and different, you know, different education and really trying to get um, good, good feedback on the process. Thanks, Louise. And, and I always think about your example about um, uh, syringe access legalization in North Carolina coming on the back of a really insidious and problematic uh, body camera bill. And so it's really hard sometimes to articulate where that hard stop is. And so I'm going to ask uh, the other uh, most uncompromising woman I know who is also deeply um, and uh, 
inventively pragmatic, Tamika. Uh, what, so yeah, what are the acceptable and unacceptable compromises in your policy work? The number one thing that is unacceptable for me is if we have a bill that we are not going to break it down. It, you know, I don't, I don't like compromising when a carefully crafted bill has been placed before a council for their consideration. You know, if anything, what I prefer to do is to load the bill up so much that when they go to cutting them, which you know is an inevitable thing that they're going to do, is that we get actually what we're wanting out of the bill by putting all of, you know, like they do up on Capitol Hill. They load up bills from the pork. Pork your bills out, put so much into it that when they do cut it, which they're going to do, you actually get what you want. That is one thing I absolutely believe in is overdoing on a bill. I'm not going to compromise on it because I know what's in there, what I am going to get out of it. You know, they wanted us to like with the, um, <laughs> the bill we have before them now for them to decriminalize the possession. They want us to break it in half. And I'm not doing it. No, because both pieces of this bill were carefully crafted. Let's put some more stuff in it to give them extra things that they can cut out of it. And that has been my approach from, from the beginning. And that, that started with like the sex work decrim bill, you know, loaded up so much that when they go to cutting, we won't miss it. I'm not compromising on that. Absolute no. Now where I will compromise on how I do my advocacy, you know, I have to sometimes bite my tongue just so that we can get things across to people. But then I try my best to figure out another way to get around it to where I can still say what I want to say without it cutting so hard. You know, I don't want people that I go to do policy work and, and advocating for and advocating with like at City Hall or even if I'm up on Capitol Hill, they're not gonna leave that room comfortable. So you have to be very strategic about how and when to compromise. If I'm getting what I want, I'll, I'll slack back some. But if I'm not, I'm going to find another way to redirect and reapproach so I can get my point across. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like playing chess with these people sometimes. You know, you got to one up them so you can get your check. Thank you so much for that granular strategy. I'm always learning so much from your relationship with the DC City Council. And I'm also reminded of one of your uh, uncompromising positions that you and your coalition took when you forbid, you know, um, marijuana movement, uh, sexual abuser, Rob Campia from helicoptering into DC and trying a ballot led strategy um, in turn to try to decriminalize sex work, you know, you wouldn't let it be done the wrong way. And that's something that um, I always, you know, uh, learn from. And so now I'm going to ask the last question. Um, and that is, and I think this is at the, this is kind of the uh, core of this session, which is how can ally organizations form productive alliances with drug user organizations in drug user led campaigns without appropriating leadership? Um, how did you mediate power imbalances between you and ally organizations in your coalition? And how can ally organizations best support drug user led campaigns? And Peter, I'm going to ask that one of you first. Thanks, Kate. Um, I think that kind of links into the the last question a little bit as well, doesn't it? In terms of you know compromises and what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, and I think it's unacceptable, certainly from a UK perspective, that um, 
you know, everything's led by drug treatment services and uh, NHS and medicalised. And um, that's one of the real difficulties for me. You know, I believe in bodily autonomy and it's been mentioned a few times on this, this already about it should be a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. An actual fact, in my opinion, it should neither be a health issue or a criminal justice issue for most people who use drugs. You know, we have the right to put in our bodies what we want to put in our bodies. We shouldn't be criminalised for, for, for doing that. And we neither need any of your health stuff involved either. We, we need a legitimate safe supply of substances which should be regulated, which should be able to be tested. But we can even do that ourselves. Again, looking to the Drug User Liberation Front, we could even do that ourselves as long as the, 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 the police, you know, could, could just stay out the way and allow us to actually do that. Um, so in terms of imbalances, you know, the imbalance is, is, is massive here. You know, like we, you, you guys are speaking about, you know, harm reduction movements and drug user led movements that are get, maybe getting little drips of bits of funding and then it, then it, then it, it makes you beholden to them. We don't have that. You know, everything is controlled through our, our current systems of, um, you know, government led um, contracts and tenders, you know, and, and everybody's in competition with other, each other in the UK to see who can win the contract, to see who can deliver it, you know, and there's been some comments on the questions there as well about recovery, you know, right? recovery just in, 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 in the UK just means abstinence, that's all it is, it doesn't mean anything else. As soon as you talk about the word, word recovery, you talk about abstinence, and that's the imbalance, you know, I come into this whole stuff from a from a, what I believe is a very unique situation. I had 11 years of faith-based abstinence recovery and just before I started doing harm reduction work, uh, you know, I was talking anti-harm reduction and I'm still I'm still winning over, I think, um, some of the people in the movement to, to say that this is firmly what I believe now, that harm reduction plays the key role in keeping people safe and also allowing that bodily autonomy to take place. So, yeah, I don't know if that can get answers answers it from a UK perspective. But again, everything I say and everything I do it is like we we are so far behind the curve here. You know, when you consider that our drug deaths right now are on a par per head of population, I mean, we've got somewhere around three hundred people per million people dying in Scotland just now, um, and that's without what what you know many areas in North America are having to deal with in terms of, you know, the, the fentanyl supply and the, you know, the the, the benzo dope, etc. You know, we, we we don't have that um, and we're not in a position to deal with any of that, you know, and obviously some of the concerns around sort of the, the current supply chains through the, tal you know, the Taliban taking over in Afghanistan, etc. you know, disruptions, you know, and potentially synthetics coming into the supply chain without a single overdose prevention centre in the United Kingdom, without any any diamorphine-assisted treatment, you know, I, I, I mean, we, we used to be the leaders in harm reduction, you know, if you look to Liverpool, you know, and what came out of Liverpool, um, and you know the whole British system where diamorphine, you know, was 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 not even supervised. People would get their system their diamorphine to take home with them. We still have some legacy patients there, but um, it's people on legacy diamorphine. But it's you know we're far we're far behind the curve here. And uh, the hope is that, from my perspective, having recently um, you know come out, I'm in a really fortunate position with the organisation that I work for because I'm allowed to despite the fact that they're a, 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 a drug treatment service, you know, I'm allowed to do these things and I'm allowed to talk about today being an active drug user um, and still be able to be employed, which doesn't happen very often. Um, you don't get, you, in, in the UK, in most organisations, you have to be two year clean to, 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 to get a job. And that includes from substitute prescribing to even get an addiction worker sort of training role in our Governments are led by addiction doctors. Um, so, yeah, so much compromise, um, but also trying to be true to, to, to who we are as, as drug users. And, and I hear you, Peter. I mean, even four years ago, when I would listen to drug user activists from Canada, you know, I would think, you know, I wish I had problems like yours. Oh, you know, to, you know, to have the option of selling out, right? So I understand that perspective, but as we in the US get to a point 
where we are allowed in certain rooms and spaces where we never were before. And we are, and some of us, some privileged few of us are allowed to be able to earn a living doing what we're already doing. You do see how insidious and difficult and nuanced the issues of appropriation are. So I do totally relate to what you're saying, but I think it's something that every um, every national drug national, regional, and local drug users union and drug user organization will have to learn on its own in a certain way. Um, so uh, we are quickly running out of time. So Anne, I'm going to ask you about um, allies and how best how allies can best help drug user organizations while still maintaining um, the primacy of drug user led campaigns. And I'm going to also combine that with a really general question from the audience. Um, Someone writes, I've been noticing that a lack of coordination has been a problem in our communities in Texas. Many organizations and providers are siloed. What are some ways that we can support people who use drugs as a cohesive community? Oh my God. Sorry, so I threw a lot every, of you at once. <laughs> but it, you know, the thing I like to say to people is just picture it. Like, I was inspired by people that were a lot more radical than me when I first started doing this work. And my shock was that you just keep picking up every rock and looking under it. And if you have to go to a church and say, we want to start a support group for people who have not been successful at stopping using drugs. You don't call it a drug users union. And you know what I mean? They'll say yes sometimes. Well, fucking jump on it. And then the other thing that we did that is I don't know why, like on welfare, and of course, you know, this is like, who can't scrounge up 200 fucking dollars? So if you've got an opportunity to hand each person five bucks, it used to be three bucks at Vandu back in the 90s. And then, you know, you get criticized for it. It's quite funny. Um, but we'll say, oh, no, that's instead of a snack. But you'll often throw a snack in too or hand out single cigarettes. And you're doing this now with no funding at all. You didn't ask anybody's permission. And it's this organic group. And it'll either go or it won't go. And there are opportunities, like over the years, you know, in Toronto at one point, this researcher had a cohort. And her cohort was an actual drug user group. Because, and we've had that happen at Vandu, like a war group called Wars. Um, Ryan uh, Thomas Kerr said, oh, I'm a researcher and I need to check in with these street involved uh, drug users who are indigenous or Aboriginal. So I'm going to give them $3,000 a year. $3,000 a year was enough to hold 40 meetings and give everyone five bucks and a snack. And if you, I keep saying, if you don't do it that way, then what fucking way are you doing it? Because you keep going to these meetings. I, I admire the people that can go to the endless meetings with these horrible people and sit there and have them explain to you why they can't do anything yeah. uh, over and over and over again. And I think it destroys our mental health. You've got to balance out your life to make sure that you're listening to people who live in alleys, the toughest motherfuckers I ever met in my life. I mean, they and they're ingenious and hardworking and they'll go, oh, we could do that. Oh yeah, we could do that. So, I mean, amongst all the we could do that. It's incredible methodology is what I teach people. Just get it up on a big board, start writing out the notes, make sure that there's continuity to next week when they come in, start learning their names, give them your home fucking number. Like, you know, that's how it's done. If it's, um, and that's with nothing and don't ask permission. And the key of course, is that that church let you in their basement for however long until they kick you out. But I'm just saying um, that's the real sort of um, way that you ensure that you don't go off track. You'll know in that community what the concerns are because they're telling you every week and you keep notes. I mean, I don't, it's sloppy. Anyway, just, I shouldn't talk too much. Okay. It's all right. Um, no, it it's wonderful. Like, it just looks like Tamika has a last word on ally support, perhaps to take us out. Tamika. Oh, yes. God, do I have a last word, you know, because. <laughs> Wouldn't Come expect anything less. <laughs> the other side to this side of the work. I was one of those people that y'all were giving these little gift cards to and it's like, you will not let the academics in this world 
claim to be the expert when you're mining my information from my lived experience. I am the expert and we need to be a lot more thoughtful about how we are engaging with these people and how we're uh, compensating them. They are the experts in this situation. You would not know a thing about my life if I didn't tell you. Right. My experience should be paid for just like the experts being paid. And that is one thing that I take very seriously. I spend the money that I get from these grants and these foundations and stipends and in and, and, and ways I can hire people with lived experience, using or not, I do not care. We have to get outside of that. We have to prove that because I use drugs, I can still do a job. That's I right. do a damn good job at mines. So do my co-ops in this room. So you cannot judge us by that. Pay us what we're worth. Closing argument. <laughs> it's a lovely closing argument. <laughs> that is certainly a fitting last word. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And please join us also for our April and May sessions where we'll be reframing the disease model of addiction and exploring alternate ways to think about drug use respectively. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Louise and Tamika, Thanks. Peter. Thank um, you. Really enjoyed the conversation. Appreciate I you did all. too. It was great. Thanks. And get get Thanks. with your local drug user union. Yes. And, That's and, and, and support them. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all. It was wonderful. Thank being. you, Tamika. It was amazing. And Thanks very much. Nice to so see you. Amazing. Yes, Peter. So nice to actually Peter, see yes. you and get to interact with you. Be well, everybody. Thank How you. How exciting. Thanks for asking. Take care.